Um, so we're going to hear um, from Beth, um, Beth Biller um, for summarizing chapter 22. Um, entitled Direct Imaging and Spectroscopy of Extrasolar Planets. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second part of day five. Um, I'm very excited to be here today to talking on behalf of um, this our whole team uh, about direct imaging and spectroscopy of exoplanets. I'm just going to go ahead and start with our takeaways. So um, just put it right out here. Why should you care about direct imaging of exoplanets? Some of you I know work on this, other people don't. Um, so three reasons I'm going to give you. First of all, uh, when we are directly, imag directly imaging exoplanets, the exoplanets we're directly imaging right now are young, giant, hot planets right right around their um, epoch of formation or slightly after. So this is a way we can start testing planet formation theories by looking at planets in their epoch of formation, or nearly so. Uh, second, we have photons directly from the planets themselves. That means that we can really characterize their atmospheres and their physical properties in great depth. And third, in the more long term, this is the technique that is most sensitive to exo-Earth twins. So if you want to image a planet like our own around a G star that's going to have a period of about one year, um, this is the way to go. All right, so the last time there was a dedicated review chapter on directly imaged exoplanets at a protostars and planets meeting was in 2005. So it's been a while. Uh, Things have changed just a little bit since then. Uh, first of all, back in 2005, uh, we had exactly zero high contrast planets. And right here, this is 2 mass 1207b. It is a planetary mass companion to a brown dwarf. And that was our one singular planetary mass companion known. So in the last 20 years, though, we have now imaged uh, about two dozen directly imaged exoplanets, although there's a lot of argument about what is and isn't an exoplanet, so you've definitely seen these famous systems already in this conference, um, HR8799, B, C, D, and E, Beta Pic B, and 51 Airy B, which is the coolest of them. Um, and so now we really have a cohort of planets to characterize, which makes this um, quite an interesting time to review this field. In fact, so here is just basically planets in general. About 200 planets have spectroscopic measurements to date. And a significant fraction of these are the directly imaged exoplanets. All right. so. Uh, the planets we're imaging to date are essentially young, hot, Jovian planets. That's what we have the contrast to do now. Uh, but the story of this field over the next couple of decades is going to be about pushing down to higher and higher contrasts. So here's where we are now, imaging uh, planets in their thermal emission. And in the next decade, we're going to be getting down into here and eventually down to habitable zone exoplanets. Uh, first, we're going to image ourselves some RV planets first. Um, so. How do we do this? I've already shown you the result. There are two main issues you need to overcome if you want to image a planet. Uh, the first is that you need the resolution to do so. This is actually probably the uh, more tenable of the problems. So if you have an Earth twin orbiting at 1 AU around a star 10 parsecs away, you need to be able to resolve something at 0.1 arc seconds. So if you can get to diffraction limited performance, so here's just size of our of the full of half max of our PSF. Um, you can do that with an 8 to 10 meter telescope. The second issue, and the harder one, honestly, is what, the contrast that you need. So as we all know, uh, stars are very bright. Planets are comparatively very faint. So if we are looking at solar system age planets, again, looking at Jupiter from 10 parsecs away, it's going to have a V magnitude of about 27, about 0.5 arc seconds away. And you're going to need to get a contrast of one part in 10 to the 9. And you need to do about 100 times better to image the Earth. So you need to get a contrast of 10 to the negative 10 at 0.1 arc seconds. Um, this is not something we can do yet. So here we are looking at reflected light. Essentially, here's the light from the star, and this is the amount reflected from the planet. And it's just, we're not at these contrasts yet. We will be, actually. That's something for protostars and planets eight. Now, what we can do right now is image planets in their thermal emission, so their own self-luminosity. Um, so here's 
basically taking this equation, uh, looking at some of our known planets. So I already showed you beta pick B and HR 8799, those four planets. Also considering slightly cooler planets and Jupiter here. So this is taking the contrast for these planets and putting them around a G star primary like our own. Um, and as you can see, we are quite sensitive to young giants. And again, we need to push down to higher contrast if we want to start getting to cooler solar system-like planets. All right, so we know what resolution and contrast we need to image planets. How do we get there? How do we go from our seeing limited blob at an 8 to 10 meter telescope to removing all the starlight and picking out this companion? Uh, well, this takes just basically a lot of technology and a lot of hardware and software. So first, let's get to the resolutions we need. So you have two options here. You can put your telescope in space. That's one solution. Uh, another is to use adaptive optics to create, to um, control the wavefront from your atmosphere from the ground. Um, so you can kind of basically, this is just an example of adaptive optics on and off. The adaptive optic system takes all of your light that's been scattered around by seeing and stuffs it back into the core of your point spread function. So in this case, here's something that would appear to be a binary. Once you turn adaptive optics on, you can now resolve it into a triple. Um, there are a lot of architectures for adaptive optic systems, and we're not going to get into that. I'm just going to show you one example of a bit of kit. So this is a, the pupil plane as imaged by a pyramid wavefront sensor, one of many options for wavefront sensors. Okay, so that's the resolution down. Next step is to get to the contrast we need. Uh, so we can use a coronagraph to do that. Um, and again, tons of different architectures. Um, they'll just show you one example. This is the classical Leo chronograph. It has a simple part and a complicated part. And the simple part is just you take an image of your star and you put a disk in front of it. The more complicated part is then you defocus again, go into the pupil plane, and use this Leo stop to actually clean up your telescope diffraction pattern. And combining this, you can remove 99% of the incoming starlight. Uh, so there's many different ways to do this. This is a different architecture. This is a vo vector vortex chronograph mask. Uh, so combining this, we can start pushing down to very high contrasts, but that still doesn't quite get us where we need to be because of the issue of speckle noise. Uh, so anyone who works in the direct imaging fields has had lots of fun trying to remove all these speckles. This is the first ex exoplanet image from JWST. On the left, you can see the data as it comes down from the telescope with the coronagraph. Uh, but you wouldn't be able to pick out the planet here because of all this speckle noise. You need to use post-processing techniques to model and remove the point spread function all these speckles to be able to pull out the planet. So here's using two different techniques. Angular differential imaging, which you heard a bit about in the protoplanets talk last, last yesterday and reference differential imaging. Um, again, lots of different choices of techniques, uh, but the key point of all these techniques is that they use various techniques to deconvolve, decorrelate your real object from the speckle. So here is a case. This is a dual-band imager. You can choose either side. I'll play it a couple of times. Um, we've let the telescope rotator turn it off, let the field rotate on the sky, and this real background star appears to track with the parallactic angle, whereas the speckles closer in just kind of wobble about. So here's where the behavior of that background star is different than the speckles. Uh, so if it was closer in, you would be able to detect it mostly because it's moving differently than the speckles. So you can use this sort of technique to decorrelate your real object from your speckles and to build an accurate model of your uh, to point, point spread function to remove it. So those are the three main techniques we need to put together. You start with your non-adaptive optic corrected image. Extreme AO gets you the resolution you need. Um, you get partly there for, for contrast with the coronagraph, and eventually using post-processing techniques to remove your PSF, you pull out your planet. So this is the how of, of how we find planets. Um, now I'm gonna move on to what are the planets we find this way like? So as I mentioned, we have a cohort of 
a couple dozen planets to image right now. I often refer to these planets as baby Jupiters. They're actually kind of more like baby super Jupiters. Uh, they have masses of three Jupiter masses or greater, um, effective temperatures of 600 to 1400 Kelvin, so they're actually pretty toasty. Uh, they're 100 mega years in age or less. They're from 10 to 100 of AU from their star, and most of these planets have a factor of contrast 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 6 times fainter than their star. Um, most of these detections have been in the near infrared using 8 meters ground based telescopes plus adaptive optics plus coronography plus post processing techniques. So, everything I was showing you earlier. And here's just the pages of examples. So what's been exciting in the last decade or two is I went from when I would give this sort of talk showing here are all the planets we've imaged, and now they don't fit on the screen. So I'm only showing you a few. Um, the really famous ones, right? So HRA 799 Beta Pic B, 51 Area B. Um, the first set of these were discovered using facility AO systems, um, and then we kind of had an acceleration of discoveries with the advent of the Gemini Planet Imager at Gemini and Sphere at the VLT. So over here are discoveries from GPI and Sphere, um, including everyone's favorite object here, PDS-70 B and C. Okay, so now we can start getting into characterization, but before we do so, we need to talk a little bit about the spectral types that we expect for exoplanets. So this is basically just an extension of the spectral type scheme for stars. Uh, but unlike stars, a young planet or a young brown dwarf, any planet or brown dwarf, starts out hot and just cools monotonically with time. So it doesn't stay in a spectral type, it transitions through these spectral types, starting out with an M spectral type, cooling to the L spectral type, which is characterized by silicate clouds and by carbon being basically locked up in carbon monoxide. Um, as you cool further, your object transitions to being a T dwarf. Those silicate clouds clear and the chemistry becomes dominated by methane instead. And eventually, you cool to the Y spectral type where you start seeing water vapor and ammonia species in your atmosphere as well. So this is the theoretical underpinning. We can see where these various spectral types fall on the color magnitude diagram. So you can see the sequence of L dwarfs here, transitioning into the T dwarfs over here. And again, the picture here is that you have, actually these red colors, in, are, you can infer that there must be silicate clouds visible to cause the red colors, and eventually they break up and you get into this clear blue T dwarf sequence. So a couple things to note, right here are field brown dwarfs, um, and here are our young planetary mass objects, either in the field, just isolated, or some companions down here, for instance, HRA 799b. The young objects are actually even redder than the field brown dwarfs. Um, and what's actually, I think what would have been the most surprising to maybe the speaker giving the equivalent talk in 2005, is that our young planets live over here on this L dwarf side. So 20 years ago, uh, at the time of the last review, we were pretty convinced that all of our young exoplanets were gonna be T dwarfs. But instead they look like they are an extension of the L dwarfs, so they have these thick, dusty clouds, all except for one. So uh, 51 Area B is our one T dwarf planet, and you can see this exactly in its spectrum right here with this methane absorption feature. Um, it's the coolest planet that we've imaged to date as a companion. And we don't just have photometry, we have low resolution spectroscopy for a lot of these planets. Um, here's just a selection um, going from an early L-type planet to our one T dwarf planet, 51 Area B. We also have maybe like an L9 planet now, I'll get to that later. Um, a couple interesting things. Again, you can see this clear methane absorption in our T dwarf is missing in our L dwarfs here. Um, you can see this L dwarf actually kind of has this triangular shape. This is actually a sign of low surface gravity. And our one protoplanet here has just a completely different looking spectrum compared to the more mature planets here. So just really quick takeaways from spectroscopy to date. I just showed you um, the low resolution spectroscopy, we're also starting to move into medium resolution spectroscopy. Uh, from low resolution spectroscopy, and indeed just photometry, we find that in general, silica cloud models fit the data better. So not proof that clouds are there, but they do seem to work better. 
And we've also been seeing this kind of triangular H-band shape. So here it is in HR8799 compared to models that don't show that shape. Um, and this is caused by low surface gravity. Um, and at higher resolution, we start to see a lot of molecular features, mostly from CO, CH4, and water, um, from all of these. But given that most of our young planets so far are L dwarfs, um, the CO features tend to be much stronger than the other features. Okay, another interesting empirical um, observation we have made for these young planets is that it seems like they are highly variable. Uh, we haven't actually measured this for a high contrast companion yet, just because they're just hard to detect to begin with. Uh, but here's an example of a very wide companion. So this is VHS 1256b. It is eight arc seconds away from its M star binary primary. Uh, so it's much easier to characterize because we don't have to fight with the primary star to image it. This is just seeing the image, the imaging uh, with the VISTA telescope here. Um, it is the most variable brown dwarf or exoplanet known to date. So this is an HST light curve of it. So in 2018, uh, over eight hours, it changed by over 20%. And then if you look at the minimum in 2018, compared with the maximum in 2020, it varied by 38%. So these, this is an easier to study object, but we expect the, bound, the t closer in companions to be equally variable. So I've presented mostly empirical results right now to really start understanding these atmospheres in detail. We need models to compare to data. So at the time of the last review on this, basically, all the models were what we would refer to now as forward models, um, sharing heritage with essentially stellar and brown dwarf models where you just self-consistently solve for each little shell inside of your object. So these models struggled with the very red colors of brown dwarfs and young planets. Uh, the best solutions were found either, as mentioned, by adding in silicate clouds, but there's also some theory that suggests you could also have thermochemical instabilities or additional vertical mixing causing those red colors. Uh, more recently, uh, inversion techniques have started to be applied to this data. So this is essentially taking forward modeling and turning it around. So instead of taking a model and fitting it to a data, you start with your data and you infer the model from that data. So I'm actually just gonna show you an example that's a hybrid of the two. Um, so one thing that's cool with some of the medium resolution spectroscopy we're starting to get for these objects is that we start to be able to measure m abundances in different molecular species. So this is looking at a Cacosiris spectrum of 8799b using the Formosa Bayesian forward modeling code. So essentially it starts with the grid models but uses that to infer the properties from the data. It's kind of in between the two. And you can see we can start putting a constraint on the C to O ratio for this object. And that, excitingly, lets us start testing, actually, not atmospheric models, but exoplanet formation models and migration theories. Um, so this has, is an interesting field, it's still growing, and I think people are finding it's a more, bit more complicated than expected. So the idea is that your C to O ratio um, should vary depending on the formation mechanism and where in your natal disk you form, your planet formed. Um, I think mapping directly from CO ratio to formation mechanism is pretty challenging, uh, but it does give us some insight. Um, I think that there's been some recent work suggesting that it might be better to look at isotopologue ratio, so it's 12 CO to 13 CO instead of directly it's the C to O ratio. All right, so I've been talking mostly about atmospheres. I'm going to talk about one other. Actually, no, I'm going to keep on talking about atmospheres. Um, I just, I really wanted to show this spectrum. Uh, so this is actually what the future for this field is looking like. We're back to the same object I was telling you about, VHS 1256b, the most variable planetary mass object. And here is its spectrum with JWST. Um, and you can basically see anywhere you zoom in in the spectrum, there's just tons and tons of features. I could spend another half an hour going through each of them. I'm not going to. I'm just going to highlight one interesting feature 
here, right, at 10 microns. So I've been talking about, oh, we infer the, from the red colors that there's clouds. We infer from the fact that cloudy models fit better that there's clouds. Um, this feature here is actually our smoking gun evidence that there are silicate clouds on this object. So here is a zoom in. This is VHS 1256B, and you see it has this plateau feature. Um, and here is a field brown dwarf that doesn't, so this slope is what you expect if you don't have silicates. Um, and here is comparison with another high surface gravity brown dwarf with a strong Spitzer silicate feature. So this is caused by small grains fairly high in the atmosphere, but this is direct evidence that those silicate grains are there and are likely res responsible for the extreme red color of this object. So again, this is the most variable object, and the picture we have then, um, and why it's so variable, is what's going on. We have these clouds. They're not uniform. There are areas um, on the top of the atmosphere that, where the clouds are thinner, a bit thicker, and that means, practically speaking, you have brighter and darker patches on the surface, the top of the atmosphere of this planet. It also rotates with a period of 22 hours. So you're rotationally modulating these different patches across this, the face of this object, um, causing this variability. So this is actually basically kind of weather on this. Now, all of the modeling approaches for atmospheres I've been talking about so far have been one-dimensional. Um, this is clearly not a one-dimensional phenomena here. So the next frontier with modeling of these objects is building three-dimensional models. So this is an example of using a general circulation model to model a similar young exoplanet analog. This is the bolometric top of atmosphere flux map. This one has a rotation period of about 10 hours, and you can see that this patchy uh, structure from the clouds here can generate quite a bit of variability. Okay, so now I am going to start winding down in terms of talking about atmospheres and talk about one other very important property that we get with directly imaged exoplanets, although sometimes you have to wait a while. So this is just one example. There's a lot of work in this field. If you look at the chapter, we go into this in more detail. Um, if you can follow planets for a long enough time, you start to be able to fit their orbits and get their dynamical masses, especially if you combine with additional techniques like radial velocity or astrometry with Gaia and Hipparchus. So this is really valuable because you need these masses to really fully test and benchmark all the models I was showing you. Okay, so I've just now been showing you all these, the properties of all these planets that we've detected um, and I kind of skipped a step. I talked about how we found the planets, and then, wow, we have planets. Let's characterize them. Um, but how did, how did we find them? Where did we look for them? How many stars did you needed to be surveyed to find the population of planets we have so far? Uh, and starting, actually, before the time of the last Protostars and Planets review, we now have a 20-plus year legacy of surveys. Uh, essentially, so all of those steps in terms of that you need to do this, step one, step two, step three, to image a planet, essentially we assembled that in different surveys. So we started out with just doing adaptive optics surveys, eventually started adding in speckle suppression post-processing techniques um, in the late aughts. In the teens, we started adding in coronography, and now since 2015 onwards, we've been in the era of extreme adaptive optics chronographs, like VLT Sphere, Gemini GPI, and Subaru Skexo. And this is, of course, when we started detecting significant numbers of young planets. And as noted, all these surveys over the last 20 years focus on thermal emission for, from young planets. Um, so very classic diagram, just looking at how stars, brown dwarfs, and planets cool with time. Um, so stars, you don't care when you observe them, but planets, if you want to catch them when they're bright, you want to go as young as possible. And so you'd think, okay, maybe we should target young star-forming regions, but in fact, um, the most popular targets for these surveys have been young moving groups. And there's two reasons for this. The young star forming regions are just a little bit further away, so this limits your physical um, resolution. And they're also embedded, which adds another set of problems. So the best um, 
balance between getting stars as close as possible and as young as possible are these young moving associations, mostly focusing on the ones from 10 to 100 million years and at distances less than 100 parsecs. And interestingly, they tend to be mostly southern. Um, so this is definitely science done best in the southern hemisphere. And now we are in the era where there are multiple 500 to 600 stars surveys that have been com completed, mostly focusing on young moving groups using extreme AO chronographs. So we have uh, Gemini GPI, so this is the first 300 stars from that, and VLT Shine, and this is the first 150 stars. Uh, so these are sensitivity plots for both of these surveys, just looking at what semi-major axis mass range they're sensitive to. Both have very good sensitivity to essentially objects with masses of five Jupiter mass or greater at semi-major axes, axes of 10 to 100 AU. Um, so the, known, the planets that were discovered before and as part of these surveys are shown here. Um, and this helped really improve the census of such planets, but they still appear to be fairly rare, even though we are quite sensitive to planets at these um, masses and separation. So the takeaway here is that it does appear that particularly wide giant planets are fairly rare. However, because we reach such good sensitivities, um, even with the relatively small cohort of planets that we have, we can start constraining their demographics and using that to test planet formation theories, uh, partly because different planet formation theories place planets in very different parts of semi-major axis mass space. Um, so these are hallmarks. There's lots and lots of uh, different simulations, but in general, core accretion is going to place planets closer in and at lower masses. Gravitational instability will produce companions um, that are further out and more massive. So here is sensitivity of an earlier survey, the objects that were found there. Um, but essentially, we have very good sensitivity now to these gravitational instability planets. We find a handful of them that probably did form via gravitational instability, but the fact that we don't find a lot of them, even though we cover the peak of this distribution with Gem Gemini GPIs and Sphere Shine, suggests that that formation mechanism is pretty rare. Okay, so just some key, key takeaways from demographic studies. Uh, so this is from Nielsen et al. 2019 from Judge Gemini GPIs, but comparing occurrence rates by fitting power laws for a variety of surveys. Um, the strong, strongest bit of evidence we have with the giant planet cohort is that it really seems that giant planets are more common among higher mass stars versus lower mass stars. And the weaker conclusion from the, this generation of surveys is that giant planets and brown dwarfs seem to have different formation, um, different underlying distributions. So roughly speaking, we think giant planets are more likely to form via core accretion, brown dwarfs via disk instability. Then you also have to define whether your companion is a planet or a brown dwarf, and that by itself is not trivial. All right. so. Um, I hinted at this a little bit when we talked about dynamical masses, but what's an exciting prospect for the future is combining different detection and characteristic te techniques on the same um, system, because uh, it just really multiplies the information you get. So our famous beta pick B planet now has a friend in its um, system discovered by radial velocity uh, by Anne Marie Lagrange in 2019, and more recently, uh, here is the gravity interferometric detection. So we really need all these techniques to get a full portrait of this system. Um, another particularly fruitful combination of techniques in the last two years, so this has really popped up recently, is combining Hipparchos Gaia accelerations with direct imaging. So you can, if you have a star that has an acceleration, you can infer the mass of a given companion, and then try to go image it. So this is a very recent detection of the lowest mass planet yet detected. Uh, three groups actually got to this within, put, posted on Astro PH within 24 hours. Um, here's another detection of a, a deuterium burning limit planet uh, with this technique that actually just came out today. So there's a bunch of press on it. Uh, but this is all, again, this is all within the last two years. So this is a really exciting technique, especially in a few years with Gaia data release four. 
All right, so I just want to kind of conclude with the future. So what is the next protostars and planets eight review on this going to look like? Um, so the next five years are going, we're now firmly in the era of JWST, right? So I'm expecting a lot of very interesting results. Um, I showed this already, but here is the very first image of an exoplanet with JWST. So this is one of these red, dusty Eldwarf planets. Um, and JWST especially, excitingly, lets us get to longer wavelengths. So this image here at 11.4 microns and 15.5 microns, these are the first images of an exoplanet ever at wavelengths greater than 10 microns. So this really lets us constrain the spectral energy distributions of these objects and the volumetric luminosity, which leads to better mass estimates. So there's a lot to do with this. And there's a lot more to find. So this data set, uh, this is the sensitivity to planets within this data set, and it was extremely deep. So especially at 4.4 microns, we're getting down to the sensitivity where we could potentially image widely separated young Saturn mass planets. So in the next 10 years, I expect that we'll probably have a handful of these. Um, we also have the sensitivity to detect maybe one or two radial velocity detected planets with JWST in the next few years. Okay, further on, in the next 10 years, uh, we're going to be breaking that thermal emission rate reflected light boundary using extremely large telescopes. So this is taking the predicted contrast curve from the PCS instrument for ELT and comparing it with simulated Gaia planets from Perryman et al. 2014, as well as known RV planets. And you can see there's a few dozen above the line. So a few dozen um, are Gaia and RV detected planets should be directly imageable with ELTs. And again, the story of this field is just pushing contrast down uh, bit by bit and moving down to cooler and lower mass planets. Um, so again, young hot Jupiters, young warm Jupiters now, and with the, um, with the ELTs, we're going to start pushing into RV planets, and maybe even a few habitable zone M dwarfs. So here's where Proxima Centauri B would fall, so maybe just barely. Um, but really, to get down to solar system analogs, well, solar system giant planets will come with the Roman telescope. To get down to habitable zone Earth-like planets, though we are looking at future space missions like HabX and LUVOIR. So this is a simulation of our own system from about 13 parsecs away with LUVOIR, and this is just our pretty picture of HabX with a star shade. So you can actually use an external chronograph if you can line up your telescope and your chronograph over thousands of kilometers. So this is going to be some very interesting technological challenges here. But this is definitely a key, key long-term goal, both to image systems like our own. Uh, so this is a prediction from an ELT in the mid-infrared. Actually, yeah, this is an ELT prediction. And this is a prediction of what an ex a habitable zone exoplanet spectrum would look like with Louvoir in the optical. And this is the point where we start actually looking for biosignatures. Right? So you start seeing lots of molecular features. Then Another question is, what, what is a robust biosignature? But I'm definitely not going to dig into that in this talk. All right, so I'm going to just kind of end where I began. Um, again, why, why you should care about this. Um, especially right now, looking at young, giant planets. Um, we are looking at planets close to their epoch of formation. So this is a way of testing planet formation theories. We understand can start really understanding the atmospheres of exoplanets um, via these gi young giant planets as well. And again, starting w ending where I started, longer terms, this is the technique that will probably yield us our first exo-Earth twin planet. All right, I think I will end it there. Thanks, and I'm happy to take questions. All right, thanks, Beth, for a very nice talk. Um, so um, let's line up for questions. Um, we'll start here. Yeah, uh, Gilles Chabrier, Lyon, Exeter, and uh, Kyoto for, for a while. Uh, 
Thanks a lot, Beth, Paul, for this uh, remarkable presentation of the uh, advances of direct imaging. I mean, it's, it's, there is a way to the future. And uh, I have three points I'd like to stress following up on your, on your presentation. The first one is that uh, I would argue that most, if not all, of the objects you're talking about, uh, and you call exoplanets, are brown dwarfs. The definition you take from exoplanets is the one from the IAU, which absolutely has no sense, as you know, as we wrote with my distinguished colleagues, Rafikov, Johnson, and Johansson, yes, I mean, uh, 10 years ago. The only possibility to distinguish a planet, meaning which is heavy element enriched from a brown dwarf, is by having gravitational moments. One day we'll get there, but so far we cannot. So, and we, so these guys are most likely brown dwarf. We know that uh, from WISE, from various young clusters, and from my condensing experiments done to one day, one day, meaning the bottom of the main sequence, then brown dwarfs do extend down to a few, maybe a couple of two or three Jupiter masses, and, and are, are consistent reasonably with the Chabrier light mass function. But it's, it's as interesting as it's yeah. if we are exoplanets. It's just something I want to stress. Okay. I guess my question is, how are you personally defining a brown dwarf? Well, it's, uh, from, it's a very good question. And uh, from, from, the, from the, uh, the, the, the formation scenario mechanism. I know you, I mean, everybody okay. would like to put a tag for sure on an object, free floating objects. But when, when science doesn't know, science doesn't know. So, but it's connected with my second remark, which is, where you show that a gravitational instability scenario at wide orbits is, is essentially excluded. And that, as we heard this morning from, uh, from uh, Lambrecht, the, the core accretion scenario is a predominant, predominant scenario for planet formation, meaning that a planet, exoplanet, must be, must be significantly metal enriched compared with a brown dwarf, which is basically pure hydrogen helium. So in that case, only the gravitational moments, like in Jupiter, will tell you w what it is. Until we don't know, I, and then and, uh, since all these guys um, follow up a sequence which is Brondo, which is uh, IMF uh, Chaboyer like, I think they are, the odds are very high that they are Brondo. But it's, it's, as, it's as interesting as, as exoplanets of Brondo are as, as interesting. And the, my, my third point now is connected with these. Uh, a silicate signature you have shown at 10 to 12 micron, which is extremely interesting uh, because, as you quickly pointed out, the, the, the conventional scenario for brown dwarf cooling and brown dwarf spectral evolution, the scenario I, I contributed to, some, was that clouds are responsible for the spectral evolution and the cooling of brown dwarf. But when Pascal Tremblin was working as a postdoc with me, we realized that this scenario has, has, has many problems, including explaining low gravity, young, very red yeah. objects. So we suggested with Pascal, based on a linear stability analysis, that there must be a thermochemical uh, instability, like a thermal line instability, in the atmosphere of these brown dwarfs. And one of the signature we had suggested is that in that case, at large, uh, at around 10 to 12 micron, you may, you may recover the silicates you're missing somewhere else. So that's very, very interesting. And uh, Pierre-Olivier Lagage and, uh, you know, his, his a PI of a JWSU project we, we submitted to, to, I mean, to observe that. And it's, it's very interesting that you, you do get it now with JWST. So JWST eventually will be able to, to find out whether, you know, the, the, the cooling sequence is dominated by this instability or, or by cloud evolution. And by the way, I'll be in Edinburgh in, in, in July, so we'll have more time to talk <laughs> to about discuss. it. Thanks, Beth. Yeah, I would say um, with the silica fe you know, feature versus the thermochemical instabilities, why not both? We really don't no, no, have no, a good right. idea. No, no, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, and also with respect to definition of brown dwarf and exoplanet, yeah. I mean, we, everyone fights about this at conferences all the time. If you go with the IAU completely, um, completely arbitrary definition of 13 Jupiter masses, I would say we, we definitely have planets that are 
image below that and some that are above that. Uh, but you're right, we can't, we're not yet probing the formation mechanism robustly. So, um, there are some, you know, like looking at the, these CTO ratios is interesting, but it's really tricky. There's also some work looking at rotation periods for companions versus free floating objects, which also might yield some insight, but we don't have large populations of these yeah. measured yet. And, and most of the confusion comes from the, the diagram you've shown from my dear friend Adam yeah. Burroughs. Uh, if, if Adam had known how much confusion he would bring in the field, I'm sorry, we, 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 we need there other people uh, opportunity to ask questions. Um, let's start in the back. Um, hi, I'm Nicolas Gurtovich from uh, MPA in Heidelberg. So you showed some uh, observations with gravity of these planets, but it seems like the main engine for detection is still single dish telescope. So I'm wondering uh, what are the future prospects for uh, detecting planets uh, with direct imaging through interferometry? That's a good question. So, I mean, we, I didn't discuss interferometry so much in, in this particular talk. It is extremely promising, especially for characterization. It's a little trickier to, you know, if you have a planet in the system already, um, it's a good way to go. It's a little trickier to use it to find um, further exoplanets. I think that in the future that we're definitely going to see a balance between, you know, just kind of single dish, um, high contrast imaging with coronography and interferometry as well. Okay, the back middle. Hi, um, thank you for the talk. El Bogat, Wash um, University of Maryland and NASA Goddard. I was wondering, since the planets that we have access to now, um, in terms of finding them through follow-up of um, transit and or radial velocity astrometry surveys, the candidates that we have so far that are accessible are pretty few, and so it seems like soon we might have imaged all of the planets that we have already know exist that are able to be imaged. I was wondering, given the long integration times that are required for imaging exoplanets, if you could comment on the observational strategy for allocating like time for surveys or um, finding new exoplanets like blind, if you could talk about that. Okay, so the last set of really large surveys, these 500, 600 star surveys, were more blind, blind surveys, like choosing stars that, had, that were as young and close as possible. Um, using this angular differential imaging technique that I showed earlier, you need to schedule your observations carefully to cover the meridian passing. So, so that is honestly what affects the scheduling more than anything else. It's been a mix of service mode as well as a lot of classical imaging because of that. Um, I think the wave of the future is going to be a little bit different. So right now, what's yielding the most detections are um, surveys that start with looking at Hipparchos Gaia accelerations. So you have some in indication that there may be a companion there. Um, but what we've really found is as long once we've pushed down into a new contrast regime, we start finding planets there. Um, I'm expecting that we're going to start finding some young Saturns with JWST, especially with the 20-year lifetime making a survey more feasible. And then, especially with ELTs, I think it's going to be less blind surveys and more we have this RV population we know exists. Let's image those. Thank you. Okay, um, back left. Hi, Sam Wright, UCL. Thank you very much for a really nice talk. Uh, you showed a plot of variation of flux as based on output of a GCM. Was there any evaluation on detectability included there? No, and what I showed you is fairly preliminary. It's bolometric flux. Oh, okay. Um, so Shen Yutan is working right now on actually the radiative transfer model so we can get you know, like more robust light curves in a given band. So that is very much work in progress. Okay, cool. That's really interesting. Thank you. Okay, the front right. Uh, Cosmos Owner from NAOJ. Uh, thank you for giving a very interesting review. So I have a two questions about the, uh, the atmosphere of the directly imaged planets. The first question is, uh, so, how, so how much we have observational constraint on the cloud properties, uh, such as the uh, mean particle size or particle shape? The another question is, uh, is there any uh, statistical trends in the atmospheric property with the planetary properties, such as the sheet or ratio versus mass or something like that? Okay. So starting with how well have cloud properties been constrained? Um, 
we're starting to get there. So this is where the retrieval methods I w was showing start to become very useful. Um, this is work we're doing less for the close-in high contrast companions because we're, we're just struggling to pull those out or you know, we've had fairly low resolution spectroscopy. This is where work done on free-floating planetary mass objects becomes very useful. So there's been a number of recent retrieval papers on young planetary mass objects that are highly variable that have started to put really good constraints on the cloud properties and in particular, whether the clouds are forced to write mm -hmm. or um, instatite in particular. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say we're going to see more of this. The JWST spectrum I showed you of VHS 1256B, that is a critical one for to trying out these sorts of techniques. Um, in terms of statistical properties, this is just tricky because we're talking about on order maybe 20 objects. It's just not quite a big enough sample that we can start saying anything robustly. I see. Thank you. Hi, my name is Maria Vincent. I'm from the Institute for Astronomy in Hawaii. Firstly, really nice talk. Uh, my question is based on star shades, which you mentioned a little bit. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment on how far we've come with dealing with the problems that have been raised with star shades, like specifically um, precision control and the fact that it takes a considerable amount of time just when we're slowing the telescope based on a target and yeah. the fact that even like light can leak through and so the diffraction control is exactly not great. Yeah, that's a, these are all really good points. Uh, so I mean, in terms of like actually having things that, you know, that deploy in the lab, that exists now. Um, I think for me, star shades have such great potential but also terrify me because any other coronagraph design, you can build a prototype in the lab and you can make sure it's working end to end, but you really just can't quite do that for a star shade. And I agree that, you know, like, um, there's just practical considerations, like, when you're at the telescope, you expect your slew time from target to target to be a few minutes, right? Not a few months. And that is a reality with star shades. Thank you. Okay, back left, back right down. Hi, uh, Anish Babaraj, UC San Diego, United States. Um, what do you think of using dynamical properties and orbits in conjunction with abundance studies to you know, know more about the formation and evolution histories of exoplanets? I couldn't hear quite, so combining um, orbital properties with what sort of studies again? I'm sorry, uh, I just couldn't hear quite. Uh, abundance measurements. Abundance measurements, okay. So using the abundance measurements to kind of make a prediction where in the disk it formed or? Um, kind of, yeah, and then orbital properties to sort of go through the migration and other dynamical interaction histories. I yeah, um, yeah, I think especially when we have a larger, um, larger cohort of directly image exoplanets with good orbit fits, that will be really interesting, especially, I'm, I'm interested to know what the eccentricity distribution of these planets are. Uh, there's been some preliminary work on this and looking also at their spins, but it's still just very early days, I would say. Thank you. Hi, Zachary Hartman, uh, Gemini Observatory. So you mentioned that over the past years since uh, Protostars Proto and Planets 5, you've, we've had these tremendous advances in, in instrumentation and in software development for reducing the data. Uh, for the next five years, wouldn't, I was wondering if you can comment on which uh, area you see more, pro more progress in mm. or which one you would really want to see more progress in. Okay, so the next five years is honestly the JWST era. Uh, so I would imagine that, that most of the new discoveries will be coming from there. Also with the combination of Hipparchos guide measurements um, and the, on the ground. Um, in that case, I think what we're going to see the most progress with in the next couple years is some of these post-processing techniques. Uh, you apply them rather differently for JWST than you do on the ground. On the ground, we usually turn the rotator off, let the field of view rotate on the sky, um, and use uh, angular differential imaging. JWST, the biggest roll angle you can get is maybe about 10 degrees, so that doesn't work as well. Instead, you would use reference differential imaging where you just take pictures of other stars, um, and that works great with JWST because the point spread functions are so stable. So I think there's going to be a huge growth in our understanding of how to build point PSF libraries and really robustly do reference differential imaging. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one more question. Back. Um, Laura Perez, Universidad de Chile. And the question I have is about the characterization of the atmospheres when, for the very young systems, you might have CPDs or even envelopes. And yes. what are the <laughs> prospects for that? 
Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so most of the atmospheric characterization work has been on the more mature objects because they're, uh, they don't have that particular complication. And I showed the set of spectra, and as you could see, PDS-70B just looked completely completely different. Um, so I don't actually have a very good answer for that, especially when you start throwing in things like you could have an accreting object early on. I don't know how that affects what you'd see from the photosphere as well. Um, we only really have, you know, like two or three protoplanets that we can really get that sort of um, spectrum from anyway. So I'd say um, when we have more of them, we may get, have a better idea. But for now, I don't have too much to say about it. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, let's thank uh, Beth again.